Mr. Shok, Mr. Ranganathan, Dr. Hari Narayan, Mr. Dinesh, uh, Sujit, our ladies and uh, gentlemen. Mr. Ashok, I hit the nail on the head. Uh, this morning, you've heard the several problems that we have in growing manufacturing in the country, and also the opportunities uh, that we have too. But he hit the nail on the head and he said, well, and also Mr. Hari Narayan pointing out, you know, people need to invest. Not enough investments are coming into, into manufacturing. Well, why are people not investing? I say because things are not getting done. In our country, we're not getting things done. And this is going to be my theme. The manufacturing plan is about getting things done. We know what needs to get done. We've heard it this morning, and I may not repeat that too much. But how will we get it done? The current reality is that manufacturing has not been the engine of India's remarkable economic growth in the last 20 years, where economic growth was touching levels of uh, 9%, and we had hopes that it would, and it will, get to 10%. But manufacturing has not been the engine of that growth. As you see on the left-hand side, manufacturing has become a smaller share of our GDP than even perhaps it was, and it's a very small share of the GDP of our country. It is, of course, much smaller than the share of GDP in Thailand, in China, Malaysia, Poland, and emerging European uh, economic powerhouse, Turkey. It's even smaller in India than amongst the most developed countries of the world like Germany and Japan. So there's something wrong about how manufacturing is being attended to and how it is growing or not growing in our country. On the right side, is the more burning problem, employment. The growth of employment in our country, the need for more jobs as more young people are coming into the workforce, perhaps going into several colleges that we create all over, giving them the hope that when they finish those colleges, they will have a job. But where are the jobs? Manufacturing, as you will see here on the chart, in India is contributing just 12% to employment in the country, which once again, I say yes, of course, it's much less than China, but it's even less than in Germany and Japan, which are highly developed countries with very expensive exchange rates and very high wages. So when we say that to grow manufacturing, to be a competitive manufacturing country, we need to have low wages and a competitive exchange rate. Well, let's turn to Japan and Germany, and maybe there are some lessons to be learned about what really drives competitiveness in, in manufacturing. So that's the reality. We have needs, and here are five objectives for manufacturing in our country. I'm going to concentrate on number two, three, and four, the meat in the sandwich. But to say this, that as you see these, you'll think impossible. Look where we are, and look how high we are aiming. How can we get it done? And it's the how, as I said, that I want to concentrate on. But let's look at what we need to get done. Number two, we increase the rate of job creation in manufacturing to create 100 million additional jobs by 2025. This is an imperative for the social, political sustenance and viability of our country. If we don't have enough jobs in the next few years, we will not be a politically viable country. The pressure to earn respectably of the young people of this country, the so-called demographic dividend, is building so high. And you see it in the politics all over the, the country itself. And by the way, this is a problem all across the world. The problems in Greece, even the problems in the United States, are problems about, well, where are the jobs? And in India, certainly, with the youngest population, as we proudly proclaim, and the largest population, of course, along with China, we need jobs more than those countries do. And so we need manufacturing, and this is an uh, imperative. At least 100 million jobs must be created by manufacturing by 2025. You can't postpone. In fact, it should be 2020, perhaps. 
because the people are born, they're going to the colleges, they're going to want jobs now. They can't wait for us to solve the problem and say, don't worry, by 2050, India will be something very big. They are going to be maybe grandfathers by then. They need the jobs now. So keep that in mind. The second, which is number three here, increase the depth in manufacturing with the focus on the level of domestic value addition. We are importing almost every manufactured thing that we need to fuel our growth. And you talked about the aeronautical industry. Yes, the domestic airlines have grown, but where have the planes come from? And we are going to need them even more for the sake of connecting the country and having good uh, transportation across the country. But where will the aircraft come from? So far, we are pleased that we get the best aircraft in the world made by Boeing or whoever, but we have to pay for these things. And we are importing machine tools, we are importing electronic goods, all of it, the best class in the world. And we as citizens are proud to have the iPads and other things in our hands, but who's paying for this? We as a country have to pay for that too. And unless we can manufacture to export, and by being able to do that, satisfy ourselves, we don't need to import, because we have the manufacturing capabilities of world class in the country, for which we need depth in manufacturing. It's not a matter of just screwdriver assembly. And we quite often claim that, look, we are producing so many of this in this country. What does you mean by producing so many of it? What have you added as value into those products? What have you added? So we must increase depth in manufacturing to sustain the trade balance of the country and the financial viability of our country, actually. Number four, which is the, uh, the third item I want to talk about, is the global competitiveness of Indian manufacturing. But unless we are globally competitive, we cannot be increasing our trade in manufacturing, improving our trade in manufacturing, and creating the jobs. So competitiveness is key. And competitiveness means compared to everybody else, not satisfying ourselves that we are better than we were before, or that my company is more competitive than the other company in India. We have to be competing with companies across the world. And if we get these three things right, and they go together, then, yes, number one, our manufacturing will grow and become the engine of growth. So setting an objective to say manufacturing will be 25%, it's just a number in the air. It's going to come out by the hard work on number three, four, and two. And then we'll get the manufacturing to grow faster than the economy, to be an engine of growth. And then by 2025, it could be 25%. And it doesn't matter whether it's 25 or 30, because we want services to also grow to provide the jobs. Because the easiest way to get manufacturing to 25 is to put spokes in the wheel of services growth. And lo and behold, we will be 25% of GDP in a, in a short time. Lastly, we must ensure the sustainability of our growth, uh, that is the environmental impacts of our growth, land use for manufacturing, water use for manufacturing, pollution created by manufacturing, and the products of manufactured uh, manufacturing in the country. Because that is also a, a, a challenge, not just for us, but for the whole world, is to ensure that we don't eat away the only earth that we have. But this is big gap between the current reality and uh, our, our objectives. And people say quite often, when recently we have been talking about a plan to, to bridge this gap, saying don't set unrealistic goals. These goals are unrealistic. And I say they have to be real, because if you don't achieve these goals, there's no India really, frankly, the way we know it, and we hope to have it, to have that. What we need is a different approach. As Einstein said, if you expect to get a very different result by keeping on doing things the way you've been doing them, you've got to get your head examined. We must get this result, and we can't keep doing things the way we've been doing them. What we have to change is the way we are doing things regarding manufacturing. And so what we've done in the Planning Commission the last three years is uh, to very diligently, with an open mind and objectively, understand how other countries that have grown manufacturing very fast and that continue to sustain their competitiveness in manufacturing, even with high wages, as I said, what is their approach to manufacturing? What is their policy? What is industrial policy, in other words, all about? And so 
Here's the characterization very quickly. You need an industrial policy for sure, as you said. If you've got to bridge this gap and to do it fast in a concerted fashion between our current reality and the goal, we need an industrial policy. The first thing was in the last 20 years, we said industrial policy is bad, which means leave things and they will happen by themselves. And whereas we've been finding that every country that has grown its manufacturing and that sustains its manufacturing competitiveness has an industrial policy. And now the United States, which along with the UK, was one of those proponents in the last 20 years to saying industrial policy is a bad thing and leave it to the market. They are waking up and saying, my God, what happened to their manufacturing jobs? And they, like the US, would not like to call it industrial policy, so they're calling it innovation policy. Well, a rose by any other name smells as sweet. And they are recognizing that there's a role for government along with industry in having a national policy and a plan to create more competitive industries within their country and more jobs. Now, we used to have what uh, was called industrial policy until 1991, which was a centrally planned model of industry and the economy in which it was an input-output matrix with controls of investments and the outputs produced by enterprises and different sectors, and they didn't do very well uh, for us. I mean, some of us uh, have been through that, and your group and myself and my group too, uh, taught us at the time. Uh, it made us tough, actually, because when you have constraints put on you, you discover the best in yourself to come out of it. Um, but it doesn't nurture. It sort of toughens you like your child. You say to your child, I'm going to give you no clothes, and yet you're going to survive in the cold. Well, the child is very tough, but everybody can't be expected to grow like that. So we need a more nurturing environment rather than this planning environment as industrial policy. The other view of industrial policy, which economists would talk about, and, and many to poo-poo, would to say, don't pick winners. Well, because big bets often go wrong. We would cite the example of Japan trying to get into computers. However, picking winners has worked for small countries like South Korea and Singapore, where they took industrial groups and took technologies and backed them, and they have made world-class winners, South Korea and, uh, and, uh, and Singapore. But we are a much larger, more diverse country, so we can't be putting bets on only a few things. We need to have a much more broad base strength in, in manufacturing. So that paradigm of industrial policy is not for us picking winners. And of course, the third one that came about the last 20 years was, let's have no industrial policy, let's leave it completely to the market. Now, none of these three work, not for us. It's been continuous. Institutionalized stakeholder involvement in the shaping and management of policies relating to manufacturing and manufacturing enterprises. Thus, there are no obstacles in the implementation. It's not enough to announce a, a policy regarding something like we do here sometimes, and then immediately it blows up with people say, but I wasn't consulted. I wasn't consulted, and it stops. And then people get hurt about the fact that you didn't intend to consult. It becomes a deeper problem after that. I don't trust you anymore. Yeah? And, and this, therefore, please recognize, is key. We've got to build again consultation and trust amongst the stakeholders. And I'm so pleased, sir, that you are here from the unions here today. Because in manufacturing, the role of people who produce and those who represent and ensure that the people are, are fairly treated is key. And this is, again, an example from Germany and Japan, which I'll come back to. Lastly, and critically, it's about the speed of learning of the ecosystem. The Japanese ecosystem after the Second World War proved to be the fastest learner about shaping industrial policy and creating competitive enterprises. I mean, they had a MITI and a consultation amongst ministries and along with the Kendiran, the industry association, and the unions. And together, the Japanese ecosystem learned so fast, it became the machine that changed the world, as they say. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't compete with that uh, thereafter any, any more. The Chinese ecosystem is learning very fast, too. And at the time that we got our liberalization, they had just a few years ahead of us, but they were much further behind us in terms of the actual strengths of their units. We had a few units here already in India which were 
uh, venturing to compete in the world. China had none. They were known for these things. But they learned so fast as an ecosystem that today Chinese companies in almost every industry are knocking down uh, their competitors elsewhere in the world. So to manage the learning, explicitly manage the learning, to make the learning faster is the key. And Deng Xiaoping put it to the Chinese to say, we shall cross the stream together by feeling the stones underneath our feet. Meaning, we will discover as we go where the shoe pinches or where the stones pinch, and together move the legs to the right places and thus move faster across the stream. So managing learning explicitly, and I'll come back to what needs to be done by us as a system to manage the learning so that our ecosystem, the industrial ecosystem of India, in which there will be investments from companies abroad and companies in India. It doesn't matter where the investment came from, but if you produce in India, it will be most productive and most competitive. That is, that is the aim. So the Indian ecosystem must now start to learn and change much faster than the Chinese ecosystem, if it wants to catch up with it. It must learn and change much faster than the Thai ecosystem and the Malaysian ecosystem and the Brazilian ecosystem, which are moving fast too. So while we are worrying just about China, there are lots of others who are looking after jobs and industrial policy too. So with this paradigm in mind that this is what industrial policy is about and what the nature of our plan should be, we uh, in the Planning Commission uh, uh, gathered uh, industry, and some from associations representing those industries, as well as experts, um, and of course the government people concerned, some from states and many from the center. And 26 groups worked together as teams. There were several sectoral groups, which you see at the top, um, and I'll refer to them again, and many, 11, which cross all the industrial groups. For example, we know that the business regulatory framework of the country is not conducive to creating that competitive ecosystem that I mentioned in which people would be happy to invest and see their investments producing results quickly. So what needs to be done to improve the business regulatory framework in the country? Environmental sustainability, land issues, the role of PSEs, and so on. And I'll come to uh, these. So there were cross-cutting groups working on issues that address all industries' needs, and then several groups working on their specific industries and policies and plans required to grow much faster the competitiveness of units in their own industries and the investments into their industries. Key recommendations, I'll just highlight some. The first uh, set of recommendations is to do with the hard infrastructure, uh, transport infrastructure in this country, power infrastructure in the country, land, and, and other facilities for industry. Clearly, this is a handicap for companies uh, in India who invest in India and wish to produce in India. So the national manufacturing policy has an element in it called the National Innovation Manufacturing Zones. These are special zones uh, created in various parts of the country along transportation corridors or adjacent to ports because we are talking manufacturing here and manufacturing means stuff and stuff has to move. So this is not a IT uh, zone which you could set up somewhere with a transmitter. You need to be here close to transportation and transportation is broken. So simultaneously with the manufacturing zone, the transportation infrastructure must be built and thus the DMIC the Delhi-Bombay Rail Corridor proved to be a, a good example of how we should go about it, building the transportation as well as the industrial infrastructure, as well as the, the social infrastructure required for the people who would be uh, uh, working in these, these new manufacturing companies. In these zones, we would be having simplified administrative procedures with delegation to the special purpose vehicles that we've set up to administer within the um, rules given to them so that things can be done faster. Now these NMIZs will be few, they need to be large, they need to be near transportation, so they will be few. And they will take a while to come up, because to get the land and to set them up. So let's say that the DMICs uh, first, and this well ahead, it's got three, four years of planning already ahead, expect that in five or six years, the first of their NMIZs would 
begin to have production units starting to produce. So as those production units five to six years from today start to produce, they will spawn the feeders around them. So we're talking about jobs coming out of NMIZs nine or 10 years from today. We must start them, of course, now. We should have started them 10 years ago, but don't count on just the NMIZs to produce the jobs that we need, and 100 million of them in the next few years. So we needed other instruments of policy which would apply not merely in these special economic zones, uh, industrial zones, but much more broadly for industry across the country. Second, therefore, one comes to, as you've mentioned it already, clustering and aggregation. Now, clustering, NMIZ is about clustering, is about putting units together so that they can share good infrastructure, so that they can interact with each other and build up an ecosystem of learning and knowledge and support, which is the essence of a cluster, actually. It's not merely having a physical place. It's Silicon Valley wasn't created as a physical infrastructure. It's just that people who happened to come together spurred each other, shared knowledge, and by interaction produced new knowledge and new, new competencies. So clusters are being used uh, in our country, in all over, but we had so far emphasized so much the physical aspect of the infrastructure. So you got things and put buildings, and you can see many of them in the country, half idle, half dead. I mean, a good unit doesn't want to be in such clusters. Yes, it'd much rather be somewhere else. So we have recognized that clusters are necessary for two reasons, one, when you want to give physical infrastructure economically, it's best to do it in a cluster. And the second is by people working together closely, they improve productivity of everybody in, in the cluster. So people have been doing this and we must do it better than any other country does this. And here we found interesting things as we were studying that the European Union, which is wishing to improve the competitiveness of uh, manufacturing companies in various countries in Europe, and the European Union then provides all the countries, like a central planning, if you will, ways to improve their own uh, industries, has concentrated on how to make clusters more effective in, in Europe. And they made a presentation last week at a, at a FICI seminar. It was a very good one, I must say. We must have competition yeah. <laughs> on uh, how to improve clusters. And the European Union presented how far they have come. They're recognizing that clusters are key, that if they could become smarter at creating and running clusters than people in China or the USA, then their units would benefit. What is the essence of a cluster? What is like an ISO standard of a cluster? And then every cluster must aim to be of that standard. And in that, interestingly, they pointed out that the quality of the association the group together that is responsible for that cluster, they are the members of the cluster, may, is the key. If the people can work together more effectively, take responsibility and work together more effectively, the cluster becomes even more effective, much more effective. And so, being European Germans, they will set a standard for that also. What is the standard required of the association and the skills and tools required by the association that runs the cluster? So, ladies and gentlemen, as we talk about vocational training, it's not merely skilling the people who will come there. It's the vocational training of ourselves as managers of, of collaborative enterprises. What is our standard as CII? What is our standard in manager cluster there? And so we have recognized this, that this is a soft infrastructure, and this soft infrastructure is, is the key. To which I turn now, I mentioned here land, water, we've got very strong recommendations on how to improve uh, our approach and implementation. But let's come to the soft infrastructure. Hmm? This is the key of manufacturing. You said, sir, very rightly, on the ground. But of course, he was talking about aircraft on the ground. I would just use the same analogy, that just having a physical place without any activity going on, mental activity, production activity, creative activity, there is no industry, actually. There's no competitive industry. Industrialization is all about what is done above the ground. It's done by institutions. It's the skills of people. It's the knowledge, technology that's applied. And these three things, therefore, technology in depth, human resource development, and the business regulatory framework are the keys in which India must learn and improve much faster than any country has uh, so far. 
because our needs are so great. Technology and depth. We need to improve, like mentioned here, industry, academia collaboration. We need local value additions, FDI policies that will facilitate joint ventures and technology transfers and strengthen our own IP regime and our standards. I'm giving you highlights and bullets. We have uh, the recommendations of the, the working groups in these areas, which were industry along with the government and other experts. They are pretty substantial and they are available in now a complete plan, which would be on the Planning Commission website and my colleague here, uh, Sriram, who's will, yeah, okay. We are aim to have it this week just after Holi, right? Yes, today, there you are, that's good. Hmm? Uh, and you can look at the details then, what is being said under these matters. I want to come to number seven, human resource development, because I believe this is the key. It is about technology, like we said, it's about skills. That's what industry and competitive industry is. But who has the technology, not the machine, it's the person who puts the technology into the machine. Those countries that have succeeded in maintaining their competitive advantage in manufacturing, even when their wages became high. And remember, the objective of development is to make wages high and not to keep them low. We are a developed country when people earn more. So if that's the objective, then we have to be competitive when wages become high, or even while they're becoming high. The human being is the learner in the system. The human being is the only appreciating asset that we have in manufacturing. Our machines will buy them and they will depreciate unless people improve the caliber of the machine and maintain them. And so you said very well about the aircraft. It's just the maintenance afterwards that is, uh, uh, that is important. And maybe, as you said, in an aircraft, you don't know how to improve it while it's flying, but I want to talk about that. You should be able to keep improving the aircraft as it's flying, and I'll come to that too. But it's the human being who then thinks about this question and saying, while this machine is working, I want it to be in the next shift producing even better or the next month. And that's what total quality management is all about. And the only human being can do that. The machine can't do it to itself. People are the only appreciating assets. And I'm saying assets in the system. And if you treat our people as the assets, and not as the cost that has to be cut down when our incomes have come down, then we'll have the right orientation to grow a competitive manufacturing industry. It's a mindset change that we need to have. And let me say here, too, that as we looked and studied and we took the help of uh, experts in uh, industrial policy and economic policy from across the world, some of the world's leaders now whose thoughts are beginning to change the minds of even people in the United States, like uh, Danny Roderick and, and the Houseman, uh, and the World Bank helped us uh, during this time, because they're revisiting also, I mean, the ideology of the last 20 years. That Germany and Japan insist that they be unions, and that they be given more formal roles than we are willing to give unions uh, in our enterprises. And maybe that could be the reason, it's counterintuitive, but maybe that is why they are able to maintain competitiveness while they keep changing technologies and even then stay ahead of uh, countries with lower costs. So we need to talk about skill development with industry participation, job creation by reducing cost of compliance for sure. There's too much irritation in the way laws are being implemented. We are irritating each other, we the unions and the unions us. We are not collaborating together in shaping something that would benefit so improve the institutions of employer-employee relations and create institutional arrangements for social security. A very substantial set of, I would say, mind-changing recommendations are being made by us, and you'll see them when you tap into uh, what's up, being put up. And the third, in terms of the soft infrastructure, is the business regulatory framework, where we are recommending that uh, mandates for regulatory impact assessment uh, be by, required by law. And it's a very strong recommendation, and we studied some recent successes of other countries in saying that any time you make a regulation or propose a regulation, by consulting stakeholders, get the impact understood, and then determine whether you need this regulation at all, because some other regulation by improvement could do the job rather than multiplying the number of regulations. So these three. I put at the bottom there uh, interest rates. 
this is a soft infrastructure. Our companies say that, especially the small scale companies, but even the big ones, that if the interest rates were lower, then our competitiveness in one stroke you could improve it and don't require too many other complicated things. Hmm? Now interest rates, I put them as a box there because this is done by institutions who are outside the manufacturing setup. It's not done by the industry ministries, nor done by uh, you people in manufacturing because interest rates affect the whole economy. So you can't take a view just for manufacturing. It is the whole economy. And in that way I want to go back and saying the transportation and power infrastructure at the bottom of the hard infrastructure is also something provided to manufacturing. It's not done by manufacturing. I mean, we manufacturing do generating our own power because we're not getting it from outside, but the most effective ecosystem would provide good power and good transportation infrastructure to manufacturing units. So these are being worked by other groups in the planning, transportation and power infrastructure, as well as the interest rates. So I've shown these as requirements, but they would be developed for us in manufacturing by others. So I come to the third set of cross-cutting requirements. One is mentioned already, promoting MSMEs. This, uh, quite a substantial amount of work has been done in the last uh, two, two years. The Prime Minister's task force looked at it, and as part of that, consulting MSMEs all across the country, and there's a very active participation of MSMEs from the South region and here from the state of Tamil Nadu too. So you understood things on the ground from their perspective and then what needs to change. And what needs to change requires so many different ministries and many of the things are to be done in the states. So just one group saying we've understood the problem, but you go back to how to get it done, you've got to get it done by uh, the states and by, by many agencies. Roles of the, uh, the management of the public sector undertakings. We recognize that at our present stage of development, we need uh, public sector undertakings where large amounts of capital, which will not produce a return very fast, may be required. In high technology areas like aeronautics, which I happen to be part of the group looking at uh, developing a plan for the growth of the aeronautical industry, it is very clear that uh, while the private sector is coming forth, you mentioned Mahindras and Tatas, they themselves say that there are certain fundamental uh, capabilities which it's not their job to provide them. If it was, then they would find it very risky to do so. So public money is required, and so Singapore does it, and the US does it, and it's NASA. I mean, this is nothing ideological about it. The government does put money uh, into institutions which support the growth of an ecosystem, and so we will require some forms of PSCs. What should they be? They should be run much more efficiently than many of our PSCs have been run, so we made very strong recommendations on new structures for PSCs. And lastly, a special attention to exports from a variety of uh, industries uh, who have now the potential to, to export, and we need exports for reasons I mentioned earlier, uh, to get our trade balances right. And so the special requirements for exports would be modernizing infrastructure at ports and airports and the improvement of Indian standards as also attention to special regions like in Africa and so on, whereby credit support policies we could induce uh, Indian exports. So these 11 cross-cutting requirements I wish to uh, point out to you and highlight that these are going to improve the ecosystem for manufacturing uh, overall. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are four sets of sectors for uh, the, the, the results themselves. The results are not produced by having good infrastructure. The results are produced by enterprises and the enterprises sit within industries. And so these uh, cross-cutting groups, sorry, the industry groups, the sectoral groups had representatives from the uh, industries involved in them and the government people and other experts. We broadly classified them into four types of sectors, of sectors of strategic importance like defense equipment and aerospace and shipbuilding and capital goods, sectors for basic inputs into the industry value chain, steel, minerals, fertilizers, cement, sectors for depth and value addition, automobiles, electronics, drugs, chemicals, petrochemicals, paper, and sectors with a great potential for employment generation, which we need a lot more of, textiles, food processing, leather and leather goods, and gems and, and jewelry. Now, the way these sectors made their plans is, is important. In each of them, it was teamwork amongst the players and the policymakers together so that they could be feeling the stones underfoot as things are being said 
and then saying what would be the adjustment made regarding sectoral policies so we can proceed. So people must come together and work like a team. Now we know that all saw about when you put people together, they first form, just to get together. Second is they storm and they don't quite agree. And then they maybe start norming, which means what is the policy required, and finally comes the performance. We've noticed that from our own experience in our country that some sectors, when they work like this, have started to produce results. Automotive has been mentioned. They made a plan. The automotive industry under CM made a plan with government involvement, and it has produced results. And the foreign companies are part of the plan too, and they're producing results. Investments are coming uh, into that uh, sector to do that. We have electronics, which is in a much worse place than is the aeronautics, because electronics goes into uh, aeronautics in a very big way too. We are importing everything, it seems, that we need with regard to electronic uh, hardware. There is some production, but it's so small compared to what we are importing. And the projections show that if our economy keeps growing and our manufacturing were to grow, not even at the rate that we are projecting here, but just at the rate at which it was growing, we would be importing $400 billion worth of electronic hardware in another 10 years, more than our import bill for oil and hydrocarbons. We can't sustain this. So the sector people have got together. They have been in the storming phase right now because foreign people's views on what's required may not be the same as domestic. But I must say, they started to norm, and policies are coming out, and you probably are seeing them. Machine tool sector, a critical sector. In India, our machine tool sector is 1 50th that of the Chinese. Our overall industrial sector is one, it's, it's, uh, theirs is two and a half times ours. Hmm? So we are smaller, but not that small at 150th. We just don't have a capital goods machinery sector anymore in relation to our industrial requirements. No wonder we are importing, and from China now, in such big ways. This is high-tech stuff, and we don't do it. So the machine tool people have got together in the same fashion, and I'm very pleased the way they worked, a very systematic plan to say what they would do what is required from the small units, what is required from the big units, what may be required in terms of government investment through some government IPSC to support the ecosystem to grow the machine tool industries with time targets and the technologies that would come during those times. And finally, I think aeronautics needs to shape a plan in the same fashion. It is not merely about the physical cluster. That physical cluster will rise fallow if we don't build the infrastructure of uh, systems and institutions uh, above it, and it's being done in all these sectors. So I won't go into each of the sectors. The details are available, as I say, on our, tech, on our website. But I had given some highlights here. This presentation would be with you. Anybody who would like it after this, I would request CII to please uh, make it freely available uh, to everybody, just to remind you. And we'd like your help to communicate to others who are not here today that this is the national plan, and we are together going to make it happen. What's required to make this plan happen? Three implementation tracks. First is the doing track for sure, the action. We need much smoother coordination in the action. The bane of our country seems to be the very poor coordination amongst agencies that have to work together. So we would be putting in place, uh, we are putting in place already, a mechanism to support a implementation of a plan by saying what needs to be done, by when, and who are the people responsible for, for doing it, smoother coordination. The other side, we need changing, of course. While we are doing the plan, we have to improve the architectures of our government programs and schemes and our government institutions. And here, sir, if I might say, we have to redesign the aircraft while we are flying it. These are the institutions we have. We can't wait to first reform the institutions before we implement manufacturing plan. We've got to do them simultaneously. And we've mentioned a few strong concepts which have already been approved by government, like the concept of agencyfication, which is very applicable to the aeronautical sector, to have an agency which is empowered, like the National Space Agency, with its mission, with its chief, with its governance, with the rules that it will implement and not having to keep consulting others, otherwise it's stuck agencyfication in various aspects of uh, industry plan implementation and government accountability and effective stakeholder consultations. And both of these to be energized by uh, de deliberate managing 
of the learning, the speed of the learning, um, a feedback constantly to the policymakers and to the various sectors about the progress they are making or not making so that they could discover the adjustments they need to make. So it's a three-track process for implementing industrial policy, and I mentioned these three tracks to you uh, when I introduced the new paradigm that we've discovered must be the paradigm if we want to bridge the gap between our rather dismal present reality and the very necessary goals that we have for our industrial policy. The structure for implementation, just flash it by you, a steering function at the top level in government, and such a steering function in every state also. To support a steering function critical, as we learned from examining why some countries do better than others, is the presence of a backbone organization, a strong program management function that supports the steering function by keeping them on track, that this is what's required, you haven't done it. Not just you say we haven't met for six months, let's call another review meeting. Too much of our progress on things that we believe are important is being done in that fashion. It's not managed to a plan. So a program management function which enables the steering function to actually steer. Then, very strongly, a stakeholder consultation facilitation. I've referred to the need for very strong stakeholder consultations. Once again, I find that many of our stakeholder consultations say, well, we consulted you. Now why are you disagreeing? I mean, you ask, what was the nature of consultation? It said, we put it up on our website. If you had a problem, why didn't you say so? Well, they're not looking at your website. And even if they looked, they said, what's the point of saying it? Because once again, you might just say it's ignored. So deliberate management of the stakeholder consultation. We noticed, like Malaysia wishes to catch up, Malaysia has in the last two years so systematically managed the consultation between people who represent different industries, different com com I mean, uh, divisions in the government, as well as the labor unions. You know, within meetings of 1,000 people in a day, with the decision taken. After six months, what progress may taken? It can be done, and we have to do it more effectively than them too. Lastly, now to yourselves. <clears throat> Four things are required, yes. Take the plan to the states. Our states are large enough uh, to uh, make a plan. We are larger than, as I say, maybe Malaysia, uh, certainly many other countries. And they are federal. They are elected, they are responsible to their citizens, they wish to create jobs in their own state, they wish to raise revenues for their programs in their own state, so a state needs to have a manufacturing plan, just as the country needs a manufacturing plan. And in inducing the shaping of these manufacturing plans, a stakeholder that is most interested is an industry association. If it's your investments, it's your future, it's your returns. So the role you play, not being just a lobbying role and complaining, but a role to induce this, as I mentioned earlier, the collaboration that is necessary, the teamwork that is necessary, so that in the state there is action, there is result. So state-specific processes for implementation, suiting the nature of institutions in the state, but keeping the mind on the three tracks that I mentioned. To put an implementation system in place in the state, just like we are uh, planning one at the center. Third is all the schemes, uh, and there are various schemes, must be aligned with the strategy, not just schemes and schemes and schemes. We've got too many schemes in the country, and we're tidying them up in the 12th plan. We find they don't converge, some are redundant, and we could just combine resources to strengthen a few good ones, we would get much more bangs for the buck. So the same in the state. And here, the stakeholders, especially industry associations, have a big role to play to help to tidy up the allocations uh, and the designs of schemes. And lastly, communicate, communicate, communicate the plan to the broader audience. Let people realize that we have a need and that we have a plan, and that by working together, we will uh, get it done. Thank you. <clears throat>